this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. This broadcast, in fact, this series of Watchman broadcasts um, is going to be the culmination, I believe, of everything that I've studied over the years, um, the things that God first taught me uh, back around 1999, 2000, somewhere around in there. Uh, so something like 22, 23 years worth of just diving into the scriptures and learning how God instructs us to interpret scriptures. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I'm going to admit to you right away that I'm not sure that what I'm going to say in this series is right. I'm, I'm going to tell you right away that I could be misreading, misinterpreting, misunderstanding, not getting it, okay? I'm going to do my best because the subject that I'm going to be dealing with in this series, I have never read anybody that has ever come up with anything like this. Um, I've, ne I've not watched any YouTube videos or DVDs or anything concerning what I'm about to share with you uh, for the next however long it takes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my time with it. I'm going to lay out scriptures. I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul always was. He was like a, a lawyer speaking to a jury. He, he always said things like, what shall we think about these things? Uh, what is the sum of the matter? In other words, I, I want you to, as the jury, I'm going to lay out evidence to you, and then you decide whether or not you're going to believe, not me, but believe exactly what the scriptures are saying. Um, when I talk about the principles that God has given me over the years uh, on, on how to interpret scripture, first of all, you should all know that I believe that this Bible is 100% the word of God. It is completely inerrant. It is there cannot be any mistakes in the Word of God or it would violate the very thing that God said in Deuteronomy 18. If a prophet gives you a prophecy and the prophecy doesn't come to pass, all he has to do is be wrong one time and God says you don't have to give heed to him. And then we have Peter saying in 2 Peter 1, we have a more sure word of prophecy. So if the Bible this Bible, 1611 King James Bible, if this Bible can't be believed, even in one place, then what do we need a Bible for to begin with? Let's just listen to the preachers as they take all of our money and live high on the hog and commit adultery and everything else. Let's just eat, drink, and be merry, as it was in the days of Noah. If we can't believe this one thing, in all the world, then we're like, as what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, we're all, as all men most miserable. There is one irrefutable, undeniable source of truth in this world, and it is the words of this book. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So I assure you that I did not come upon the ideas that I'm going to share with you uh, from some science fiction book, 
from watching some movie, uh, from some internet garbage, or some commentary. It came as a result of me looking at some scriptures and asking God questions. Jeremiah 33, 3, my favorite verse, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Now, for any man to say, I already know everything that the Bible says and means, and I don't need anybody else to tell me some new thing or whatever. For any man to say that, I think is ridiculous. It's, it's pride. It's what it is. And I used to be full of pride. And God knew how to drive that away from me. Let me, let me explain what I mean by these principles. Uh, number one, believing the literal words of the Bible. Every word of God is pure. And so for me to like go to the Greek or the Hebrew to try to change a word to make it fit into something that I want to believe, I don't do that. I just take it for what it says, uh, the numbers of the Bible. And I'm going to go through some of these. In fact, one number in particular that I've already spoken about, the number 12, I'm going to kind of tweak the meaning of it a little bit from things that I've said in the past. The numbers are there for a reason. The numbers and the things you see in a list in the Bible, uh, they're there for a reason. I'll give you an example. The number four, it represents the spiritual realm, spirits, the gospel, a false gospel. So you have Paul warning us that we're wrestling against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, the Geneva Bible, which preceded the King James, added something in there. They had five things that we wrestle against, and they added the words against earthly powers because the Geneva Bible was translated by Puritans, and they hated kings because kings had them persecuted, and queens, Queen Mary. Um, the, uh, but they, they didn't like the idea of a king, even though Jesus is one, David was one, Solomon was one. Anyway, they didn't like that. So they added that in their text, which is wrong. You can't do that. So there's four things that we wrestle against, and all of them are spirits, principalities, devils, powers, devils, rulers of the darkness of this world, devils, spiritual Wickedness in high places is the fourth one. So it defines all of these as being spirits. And that's what I'm talking about with the numbers. So when you look at things like four, 40, 400, 4,000, I don't think there's 4 million in the Bible. But anyway, 40 days. How many times does a 40-day period pop up in the Bible? Well, I don't know the exact number, but numerous times. What does it mean? And that's going to play into what we're going to look at. Bible typology. I had more fun in the early years of my study when God opened up the realm of Bible typology to me. I had more fun reading the Bible, thinking about things in the Bible in those early years my wife, I drove my wife crazy during those years because we'd just be driving down the road and all of a sudden I'd go, oh, like that. And she'd get scared to death, like I was going to wreck or, you know, whatever. But what it was, God was showing me a type in the Bible. I'll give me an easy one, David and Goliath. The typology of David and Goliath is Christ and Antichrist in the last days because Goliath, six cubits tall, his brother's got six fingers, uh, spearhead weighing 600 shekels. Um, David said, thy servant killed both a lion and a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, a lion and a bear. That's the beast in Revelation 13. And he has a wound in his head like the beast in Revelation. So Goliath, the Antichrist, Christ, David is the shepherd, okay? Size doesn't matter, okay? Doesn't. 
So typology, the stories in the Bible. Uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. Paul said that all these things are written for in samples unto whom the ends of the world are come. And so these things here in the Bible, these stories, they're not just Sunday school stories, vacation Bible school stories, or bedtime stories. They are showing you what is going to happen in the last days, especially with the people of Israel. And that's going to be the main part of my focus in this series. Um, God speaketh once, yea, twice. I used to hate to read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. I used to, because I'd read them and I'd go, why do, this has already happened. So why am I reading it? What, what difference does it make? But then in Job, it was said that God speaketh once, yea, twice. David repeated that almost word for word in the Psalms. God speaketh once. Twice have I heard this. So when you understand that the prophets of the Bible have a partial fulfillment, that's God speaketh once, and then a perfect last day's fulfillment, that's God speaketh twice, then it starts getting interesting. Let me give you an example. In Joel chapter 2, Joel talks about the sun should be darkened, the moon should be turned to blood, uh, there should be blood and fire and pillars of smoke in, in, the, in the day of the Lord. Um, your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That's sort of how Joel put it. I'm just kind of not giving you the exact quotation. And you go to Acts chapter 2, and Peter is saying, this is that which was spoken by Joel, and he begins to quote Joel with, it shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour up my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and there shall be signs and wonders in the heaven above, uh, blood and fire and vapors of smoke, and um, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall be turned to blood, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, when you go look at, when you go compare those two passages, when Peter said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, if you go back to Joel chapter 2, where that verse is, there's a comma right after that, meaning this sentence wasn't finished. But Peter finished it right there. He cut it off. And he said, this is that which was spoken by Joel. So it tells you that there's more to be done there. Also, on the day of Pentecost, when this was supposed to be fulfilled, were there signs and wonders in the heavens? Was there blood and fire and pillars of smoke? Was the sun darkened? Did the moon turn to blood? Did the stars fall from heaven? None of that happened. So that's a partial fulfillment in Acts chapter 2. There's coming in the last days a perfect fulfillment of everything that God said was going to happen. You can look at all the prophecies that are quoted in the New Testament, go back to the Old Testament, find out where they were. Like, Rachel sh shall be weeping for her children. That was uh, a fulfillment of, I think it was in Jeremiah, in the days when Herod had all the children slaughtered, trying to kill Christ as a, as a child. Rachel was weeping for her children. But when you go back and read that in Jeremiah, there's a lot more that was supposed to happen that didn't happen. It says God failed? No. Has his word failed? Of course not. It means that God speaketh once, partial fulfillment, twice a perfect last day's fulfillment. Okay? And that and I think that applies to practically every prophecy 
in the Old Testament is going to have a last day's perfect fulfillment. Um, this verse in Isaiah, here's another principle. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. And we're going to take scriptures and we're going to connect them together. Scriptures out of the Old Testament that maybe you didn't understand or scriptures in the New Testament. And I'm going to give you one in a minute that maybe you just didn't comprehend. Maybe you didn't, I, I, and I've done that. I've looked at that and I'm going, what in the world? And I'm going to read some of those here shortly, okay? Um, the exact literal, I mentioned this earlier, the literal interpretation of the words that are in the scriptures and the scriptures themselves defining their meaning. Symbolisms in the Bible. Yes, there are symbols in the Bible. In, even the numbers are symbols. This is where our amillennial friends are pretty good at. They say that a thousand years is symbolic of a long time, but it doesn't mean a thousand years. Well, I think that it is a symbol of something, and it means a thousand years, exactly a thousand years. Was three days, three days? When Naaman was told to dip in the River Jordan seven times, did he, could he just think that he did it? No, he had to do it. And he didn't want to, you remember? And his servant said, if he would have told you to give him a bag of gold, you would have done it. If he would have told you to tear that mountain down, you would have done it. So why not go dip in the River Jordan seven times? So he did it, and it worked. Okay, When Aaron, the high priest, was told to dip hyssop in the blood of the lamb and sprinkle it upon the ark seven times, could he have done it eight or six or ten or four? Could he have just thrown the hyssop at the ark? Walk? No, he would have been dead on sight. The numbers are there and they are critical. If God says, I want it seven times, then he wants it seven times. If God said it's going to rain 40 days, mark it down. God told Noah, for yet seven days. And then I want you to get on the ark. Seven days from now, it's going to happen. What happened seven days later? Boom. Fountains of the great deep opened up. That's part of this. And the windows of heaven were open. That's part of this too. Okay? So these principles that I've been studying for all these years, all put together for this one idea that until recently I never even considered anything like this. Okay? So let's get into, to start out, I'm just going to kind of give you a hint on where I'm going with this, okay? I'm going to ask you two questions from Scripture, and I've got two Scriptures per question, okay? The first question, let's read Deuteronomy 28, verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth. I want you to remember that eagle. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. Then he says it again in Jeremiah 5. I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. A nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Remember, God speaketh once, yea, twice. So this has had a partial fulfillment. When the, ten north, when the ten northern tribes were taken into Assyria, to Assyrians 
and they may not have known the Assyrian language. Or when Judah and Benjamin were taken captive into Babylon for 70 years, they didn't speak Babylon. So, partial, but eventually, if you're there 70 years, you eventually learn some of the language, don't you? Okay? Now, let's go back and look at exactly what God said. Because God didn't say a nation whose tongue you will eventually learn. He said in Jeremiah 5, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Back in Deuteronomy 28, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Thou shalt not, future tense, meaning you will never understand this language. Now, the Jews have been dispersed all over the world, okay? There are Jews living everywhere, except maybe Japan. Japan don't like any foreigners. Um, but anyway, name a language on this earth that some Jew somewhere doesn't know. I mean, name a language from people on this earth that nobody knows what they're saying. We're, we're living in the days of Google Translate. We're living in the days now, like on Star Trek, where aliens talk and all of a sudden the humans know what they're saying. How did that happen? Well, you find out there's a universal translator on the Enterprise, and as the aliens are speaking, it's translated for them and back and forth, okay? There was one episode where Picard in The Next Generation had to go to a planet because the language they couldn't figure out. And then they figured out it was like a his, it was a language based on historical events, and Picard eventually figured it out, okay? And they were able to talk. That was a pretty good episode. But you get what I'm saying. There is right now no language anywhere that somebody somewhere doesn't understand it, okay? There's always a translator for every language on the earth, okay? So my question is, number one, who is this ancient nation? Who is this ancient nation that can fly like an eagle? Who is this ancient nation that speaks a language that nobody will ever know what they're saying? Who is that? That's the first question. <clears throat> Second question. Deuteronomy 29, verse 28. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. So we know a partial fulfillment of that was God taking them out of their land, sending them off to Babylon or Assyria. Deuteronomy 30. Now let's look at it. Here's the second question. Verse 3 that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity. In other words, if Israel repents and calls upon God. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Remember what I said, there are Jews. There are Jews in New York, there are Jews in California, there's Jews in Russia, Germany, there's Jews in Europe, there's Jews in Africa, there's Jews in everywhere. Okay, Australia, New Zealand, you name it. Maybe even some Chinese Jews, who knows. He's going to gather them from, but then he said in verse 4, If any of thine be driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. Now, question number two. Was there ever a time in the Bible 
where Jews went and lived up in the sky, up on the moon, Mars, planet Vulcan. That's where uh, Leonard Nimoy got the Vulcan sign. Leonard Nimoy is a Jew, and he grew up going to synagogue. His father would take him to synagogue, and the Jewish rabbi would give the blessing. Uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord blessing, or something like that. But anyway, he would do this, okay, like a cloven hoof thing. It's a cult, really is. And so Nimoy, as a child, was fascinated by that. And when he is developing his character as Spock, you know, Vulcans don't go, howdy. Okay, so he came up with that. And Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry, loved it. He said, that's it. Yes, you use that, okay? Like the Vulcan nerve pinch. They had a scene where Spock is going to hit somebody in the jaw and get into a fight. Well, Vulcans don't do that. So Spock just, he said, what if I do this? Pinch a guy somewhere and he just collapses. And Roddenberry goes, that's what a Vulcan would do. So anyway, you get that. But my point is this. I've watched too much Star Trek, haven't I? My point is this. When have the Jews ever lived in heaven? When, have they ever, when did that ever happen? It hasn't. But why did God say, driven out unto the outmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Lord... The outmost parts of heaven, the farthest places in heaven. And I'll show you what we mean by that in a minute. And it's not just hyperbole. If you, hyperbole is, the word hyperbole is the most amazing, outstanding, wondrous, uh, mysterious, grandiose word that has ever been invented in the history of the universe. That's what hyperbole is. You thought it was hyperbole, okay? Like, you know, a really good toilet bowl cleaner. New hyperbole. No, it's hyperbole. It's not just God exaggerating something. Even though you might end up way out in heaven, I'll gather you. If God said that in there, and by the way, he didn't just say it once, okay? If God said that in his word, what does that mean? So number one, who's that nation that's coming? And yes, the Bible says that there are spiritual nations. We are. We are, as Christians, we are a spiritual people. That means our spirit will survive the death of this body and we will rule and reign with Christ. We will be as the angels in heaven. So yes, there are spiritual nations, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. So those are the two questions that I'm going to start out with. And then now I'm going to go back to, we've been doing a whole series on Matthew 24. So I thought I would start there because there's something in Matthew 24 that has always been a question to me. I never could figure out why Matthew said one thing and Mark said another. And let me show you what I mean. Matthew 24, verse 30. Remember, God said, even though you end up in the outermost parts of the heaven. Let me read it again. From thence will the Lord thy God gather thee. Now look at Matthew 24, 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Where, who's in heaven? Who's living 
in heaven from one to, and if they're in like where, where heavenly Jerusalem is, why would they need to be gathered together? They're already there. Now look at what Mark said. And there are no discrepancies in the Bible, right? There's not, well, that's a mistake. They, you know, Matthew should have said this. No, 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 no. Matthew said exactly, holy men of God spake because they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Matthew said exactly what God wanted him to say, that God is going to send his angels to gather together his elect from one end of heaven to the other. And that is exactly what we just read in Deuteronomy 30. Exactly. Now look at Mark. Mark 13, verse 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming. This is the companion verse. With great power and glory. Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. So now we've got two different groups. We got a group here on earth, and you all know what I believe on that. I believe that that is us. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Where are they? They're in the earth. They're buried in the grave. The dead in Christ shall rise first. The graves are going to open up. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, or in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So he's going to gather his saints, Gentiles, I believe, together, and a few Jews, because I know a couple Jews that are saved. He's going to gather them from the earth. But who is he gathering out of heaven? So he said it in Matthew 24. He said it in Mark 13. Who is he gathering? And where are they in heaven? And remember, when the Bible says heaven, and we're going to see this here before too long, when the Bible says heaven, there's one of three places that that could be. What does Luke say? I've been thinking about this all night last night because I didn't have this in my notes until about, uh, about midnight last night. And I went, yeah. Remember that eagle? Remember that nation that's going to come as swift as the eagle? Okay, remember that? Here's how Luke put it in Luke 17. He starts out in verse 30, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, revealed from heaven. That, that matches Matthew 24. There's Jesus appearing in the clouds, and all, everybody's going to see him on that day. So when the Son of Man is revealed in heaven, that's the context, that's the timing of it. And we go down to verse 34. I tell you, in that night, there should be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. And two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, where, Lord? Taken, what do you mean taken? Taken where? And this is how Jesus answered it. And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now, again, this is from the, the principles that God has given us in his word to understand scripture. Number one, in Mark chapter 4 um, and Matthew 13, the parable of the seed and the sower, Jesus defines birds, the fowls of the air, as angels, albeit, in this case, bad ones. Because he said, 
uh, when he gives the parable, he said, you know, the sower soweth the seed, and some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. When he gives the interpretation of it, he says, Satan cometh and devoureth it. Okay? An evil angel, you know, with wings. Devils. That's what they are, devils. And you remember, eagles are on the list of unclean food, unclean birds. They were not allowed to eat eagles. In fact, if you look at that list, they couldn't eat eagles, vultures, crows, things like that. Why? Because they ate flesh and maggots and guts and everything. Okay? Whereas God's Holy Spirit is seen how? As a dove. What do doves eat? seed the word of God so eagles the fowls of the air they eat they they consume flesh people animals okay so that to me says something that these eagles are not just like bald eagles, that they are spirits, probably evil ones, since they are listed as unclean. But the premise here is, is that some people and this is the title of this series. I had it called something else. Then I decided this is what it's going to be. Taken. Taken. Now, we know Lucifer. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? He's not the light. He's simply the light bearer, which matches, that name, Lucifer, matches exactly what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Angel, angelos, means messenger. A messenger of light. A bringer of light. A bearer of light. See the connection? Lucifer and angel of light. Okay, so meaning that the devil is not really an angel of light, but he, he transforms into an angel of light. He's going to look like the mighty angel in Revelation 10. Whatever you think about that mighty angel, whether it's Christ or some other, he's an angel of light because, I mean, his face is shining like the sun, right? So Satan then is the counterfeit angel of light. And his ministers also appear as ministers of light as well. They transform themselves or are transformed also. And I think it's possible that Satan's ministers also are devils and human agents. I believe that too, but I also include devils in that as well. He's got a bunch of them. A third of them, of however many there are, Satan owns a third of them, all appearing as angels, glorious angels of light. I mean, who wouldn't follow that, right? Who wouldn't follow that? I, I, I watch a lot of videos looking for things like in the paranormal, and in several of them, and I believe I believe that it's possible that some of these videos are real and true events. You see shadows. You see dark shadows, like in an old house or something like somebody says their house is haunted, and you'll see on video a dark shadow running across the room or looking around a door and then ducking back, and it's always, and that scares everybody. But what if it was a bright 
shining, glorious being. People would go, because we are turned on by light, right? Okay, I, I got to move on. So, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Which heaven? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. We're going to discuss that later, where the north is. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So number one, he's going to be a counterfeit angel of light. He is going to be a counterfeit Most High God. People are going to worship Satan, believing they're worshiping the real God. Ezekiel 28, I am a God, capital G. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. That's what John saw. That's what Ezekiel saw with the firmament and the throne and the angels, the chariot of God and so on. Okay, so he's a counterfeit God, 2 Thessalonians 2, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It's a counterfeit most high God. Um, Jesus is the good shepherd. Then the devil or the antichrist is the idle shepherd, I-D-O-L, the shepherd that doesn't move. Okay, he's the idle shepherd. He's a counterfeit shepherd. He is a counterfeit lion. You have Christ, the Lion of Judah, who is the only one worthy to open the book. That's the context of Christ being the Lion of Judah. But then you have the devil walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's counterfeit Lion of Judah. Okay. Uh, he has a counterfeit gospel. Ye shall be as gods. Ye shall not surely die. That's immortality. That's what we are going to attain to. But ye shall be as gods. And how does that come about, Satan? How is it, according to your gospel, that we get to be immortal and live as gods? Just disobey what God said and eat that fruit. See? It's a counterfeit. It's a fake. Now, what about if Satan counterfeits everything that God does? What about a counterfeit rapture? Now, I've had this in my mind for a while. Let me read 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52, and I'll explain what my theory was before. Behold, I show you a mystery. So we know it's related to the mystery that Paul and Jesus spoke about. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So, one part of the rapture or the translation or being caught up or the resurrect, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same thing. One part of that is, is that we are transformed. We get rid of this vile body. Ugh, vile indeed. And we are made like his glorious body. So we are Trans, it's like he spends time before verse 51 explaining that we are the seed that's buried in the ground. It's what we do with seeds. We bury them. It's what we do with dead people. We bury them. And what comes out of the ground doesn't look anything like what we put in there. That's the analogy. It's been transformed. Now, what, what was... What comes out of the ground, it was in that seed all along. This is the seed, okay? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So, 
I've, I've believed and still do for years that a transformation was coming both to the saved, the born again in, in Christ and all of the lost of this world. They are going to also be transformed. His ministers transformed, right? Being born again of corruptible seed so that they are transformed in their bodies, but it just, in, it initiates their final corruption. All right, because everything the devil does starts out as glorious, right? You remember like in the party days when you used to get drunk with your buddies. It's when you first started drinking, it was glorious. Man, that was some party, wasn't it? And then the next morning you're like, Ugh. see, that's how it always turns out with the devil. It starts out as great, sort of like being with another mate. Feels great at the time. Then you got to worry about hiding it, making sure your wife or your husband doesn't find out how this could ruin your life. Drugs, the same way. Taking drugs, you get that high, then you get pulled over and you get busted because nobody knows you're doing drugs. And now you've lost your job, your family. That's the devil, okay? So I've believed for a long time that Satan was going to transform every man, woman, and child on this earth, okay? And then, then I stopped there. But that's not all there is to the rapture, is there? Because once we're transformed, what happens to us? Well, that's where we bring 1 Thessalonians 4 in. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, which means dead. They sleep the sleep of death, the Bible says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, first, we're transformed. This vile body's cast off. We now have our new body. We are the body of Christ at His second coming. And then, taken up, caught up, and do we just hang out in the clouds? No. Do we go and build us a city on Mars? Why? We have a better heaven than all the other heavens. We're going to live in the heaven of heavens, the Bible says. Okay? So, 2 Kings 2.11 is another witness of that. It's, remember Elijah, and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire. Think about, stop right here. Think about what that is. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Okay, so the angels, this is the angels that's coming to gather us up, chariots. So Elijah says, well, there's my ride, right? There appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, because the chariots got to have horsepower, right? And parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Okay? So, I, I, in my mind, the picture is he gets on the chariot and is carried up in, by the whirlwind, which is a, an energy vortex. Okay? 
He's carried up in that chariot by that energy vortex, that whirlwind, and taken up where? Into heaven. And again, is he in the clouds? No. Is he on the moon, Mars, Saturn, Io, the moon of Jupiter, which they say could possibly contain life? No. He's in the heaven of heavens, okay, where all of God's people are going to gather together. Now, think of the counterfeit. And this, this um, translation, this rapture of, of God's people, it's like the culmination of everything that the gospel is about, the mystery of God. When Jesus was giving the parable of the seed and the sower, he says, unto you it is given to know the mystery or the mysteries, says it both ways, of the kingdom of God. In Revelation 10, when that mighty angel comes down with the book in his hand, um, he says uh, that uh, time should be no longer and in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, meaning the seventh trumpet, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his, by his servants the prophets. I just messed that all up, but you, you get it. That when the last trump sounds, the mystery of God shall be finished. And what is the mystery of God? Well, Ephesians 6, 19, Paul says, Pray for me and for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the salvation of mankind through Jesus Christ our Lord and the resurrection. Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. So the mystery has partially to do with the Gentiles. It has partially to do with Israel. For Paul said in Romans that, Beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, Christ, the seed, the word of God in you, the hope of glory. He's that new man on the inside of us that is transformed and caught up, okay? And then, of course, Paul used that. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And there he's talking about the rapture. So the gospel is all about Christ coming, death, burial, resurrection, that he, his seed is in us, the word of God. We become sons of God. And when this body either dies or the trumpet sounds, the last trump sounds, we, this body is replaced with a new body, and we are in heaven with Jesus Christ. Ta-da! That's the mystery. Okay? And it's going to happen, according to Revelation 10, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, that the mystery of God should be finished. So at that time, the transformation of the Gentiles and them being caught up takes place, but also the mystery then revealed. Israel, instead of being partially blind, now they can see. The veil of Moses is taken off, and they see who that really is under there, shining like the sun. It's Jesus Christ. They're going to be born again when the mystery of God is finished. Okay, and that is when he's going to gather us who are on the earth and the Jews, whether they're on the earth or in the outmost part of heaven. about it. So, remember, 
everything that God does, from God to a, to a Savior-like person, Jesus Christ, you had um, Apollo, the God of prophecy, you had Quetzalcoatl, who dies on a cross, you have, um, oh, who are some of these other Savior dying gods? Look that up at Wikipedia, there's a whole article on the dying God. Manly Hall talks about it. It's in all the mystery religions. You have a God who sacrifices himself for the greater good. It's in movies. You have like Neo in The Matrix who sacrifices himself. He's died and then he's resurrected. Now he's the one, the savior of mankind. And he can fly and you get all that stuff. So if there is a true gospel in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, then there is a false gospel. And that false gospel would be a transformation of man so that man would be immortal and be like the God. Where do the gods live? Think about it. So here's, here we bring in the numbers, the number four. And exactly four times the Bible, specifically the Apostle Paul, references a false gospel. Look at what he says. 2 Corinthians 11, 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And bottom line is, if it's another gospel, it's going to be another Jesus, and it's going to be another spirit. It will not be the Holy Spirit, and it will not be the real Jesus. It'll be a counterfeit spirit, a counterfeit Jesus, and a counterfeit gospel that transforms man and makes him immortal, but only temporarily. Okay? That's the first time he says it, 2 Corinthians 11. Then he says it, Three times in Galatians 1. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So he says it once in 2 Corinthians 11, 4. Then he says it, Galatians 1, verse 6, another gospel. Verse 8, any other gospel. Verse 9, any other gospel. Four times. Which links you to, what was that last kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar saw on the earth? The fourth kingdom. And the fourth kingdom is made up of principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness and high places. You see, see how it's starting to connect here? Now, I believe 100% that there will be an angel from heaven who will bring this gospel to mankind, this other gospel. To mankind. I absolutely believe that. And before I get into that, let's define the word heaven 
the way the Bible does it. Okay? So, and that's done in 2 Corinthians 12. Listen to what the Bible says. Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Now, some say that Paul was speaking of himself because he says, in, whether in the body. I kind of think that um, Paul couldn't discern whether he actually met this person, you know, like physically, like, hey, Jim, how you doing? Shake hands, and Jim tells him this story about, you know, what he saw. Or that Paul received this by some sort of revelation, the Holy Ghost showing him this guy named Jim, I made that up, who went into where he's going to describe here in a minute. That's kind of my take on it. I could be wrong. But anyway, I cannot tell whether out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, you've heard of Seventh Heaven. There used to be a TV show called Seventh Heaven, and it was about, you know, a minister and his family, and, of course, the minister was played by a Hollywood actor who was later found guilty of uh, having an affair with an underage girl. Uh, but anyway, um, there are not seven heavens. That's some other doctrine. I think the Muslims believe in seven heavens. But God mentions three. The first heaven, and I happen to have a picture of it here, is the sky above us where there are clouds. Okay? The second heaven, there is a, a line that actually goes around the earth, and it's called the Karman Line, K-A-R-M-A-N, named after the guy that discovered it. It's the end of the first heaven. There's a literal line where the atmosphere ends. Um, if you watch the movie First Man, um, it, it's about Neil Armstrong, and this is a true story. He's flying an experimental plane with the number 666 on it. I'm not kidding you. His, that's a true story. That's the end number on the experimental plane, 66672 or something like that. But it's three sixes. But he's flying this experimental plane, and it's got wings and ailerons and everything like that, a tail fin. So it's meant to fly through the air, but it's also got rockets on it on the wings and so on and he flies up and gets up to above the Carmen line now above the Carmen line there's no air so he gets up there and all of a sudden he starts experiencing weightlessness and he's going uh oh because he takes the yoke and tries to aim it back down but he can't because there's no air up there, and that's how the wings work. So he, he tries it once and bounces, literally bounces off the Carmen line. He hits the atmosphere, and that's the thing about re-entry. If any space, like the space shuttle or any of the capsules that fly up and come down, if they don't come down at the right angle, they will bounce off the Carmen line back into space. So it has to be calculated just right. But anyway, Armstrong hits that Carmen line, bounces back up, and he's going, oh, now what am I going to do? Okay, I'm in space, but I don't want to be in space. So he uses the rockets on the wings to tip the airplane sideways, and he literally, like a, like a knife, cuts his way into the atmosphere. And you watch that. It's, you might be able to find a clip on YouTube if you don't want to watch the whole movie. But it's pretty cool. So there's a, there's a line where the first heaven ends. 
Then the second heaven is where the moon, all the stars, the planets, as far as the Hubble can see, and now we have the James Webb telescope, which apparently is designed to see even farther into heaven. And we still, we know that beyond what we can see, there's still more universe. And it's way out there. 13, 15, maybe 20 billion, maybe 100 billion light years away. We don't know where it ends. Okay? That's the magnificence of it. It is such a vast expanse. It's beautiful. And it's full of angels, stars, right? So where do angels reside? Well, some of them reside in the third heaven, which is where Jerusalem above is. Okay? That's what the Bible calls the heaven of heavens, plural. So, the first heaven, the sky above us, the second heaven, the expanse of the firmament, outer space, the universe, those two heavens have a heaven above them. And that's where God lives. In fact, check this out. So let's say, let's say that my fist is the earth. That's the first place. The sky above is the second place. The universe above that is the third place. And where Jerusalem above is, that's where the city is built four square. Isn't that neat? Okay. So, when God said that even though you are cast into the outmost part of heaven. I don't believe he was talking about Jerusalem above, the third heaven. And I can't see where anybody can live in the sky. So where would that lead? The second heaven. Am I crazy? I don't, well, maybe for some reason I am. But as we get into this further, maybe you'll start to see it. Okay? So I'll explain more next week. We'll get into this idea of an angel from heaven preaching any other gospel because it's happened before. It's happened before, and I believe that all of that was a setup to happen again, okay? I hope, if nothing else, and I know that in the comments, I'm going to get criticized. I'm, I'm okay. Criticize away, because any man, any preacher... If his ideas cannot stand the weight of criticism, he has no business being in the pulpit. Okay? Let God be true, and every man a liar. But I assure you, I'm going to try to stick as close to this Bible as I possibly can. All right? I hope you're blessed. I hope you're intrigued. I hope, if nothing else, it turns you to the scripture to see whether these things be like the Bereans. Turn no, don't go to the internet. Don't go to your flat earth people. Go to the scriptures to see whether these things be true or not. All right? You are the reason why we do what we do. Remember the people of Kenya? Remember our feeding programs? We fed this week. We're going to continue to feed until we just flat run out of money. Because those people are starving to death. Okay? So remember them. Pray for them. May the Lord bless you for it.
We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.